This is The Wheelhouse. For Connecticut Public Radio, I'm Frankie Graziano. And today's the day. The new wheelhouse. From now on, every Wednesday, we got your weekly dose of politics in Connecticut right here on Connecticut Public Radio. We're going to tackle everything happening at the state capitol and beyond. Unpacking topics like tax cuts, human composting, prison reform, and more. We got to start this thing. And we start the wheelhouse with all things transportation. Specifically how lawmakers are hoping to make our roads safer. Last year was the deadliest year on Connecticut's roadways in recent memory. More than 230 people died in motor vehicle crashes and another 75 people who were walking or biking died in crashes. That's according to the Department of Transportation in Connecticut. And in response, lawmakers are considering several bills this session with the goal of making our roads safer. A bit later in the show, we'll be looking at maternity care deserts in the state and how the Lamont administration is planning to address the issue. That's a little bit later. But first, let's talk about transportation. Here with me on Zoom first is Susan Raff, Chief Capital Reporter at WFSB News Channel 3. Good morning, Susan. Good morning and congratulations, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for having uh, for coming on. and Thank you for posting a great picture of you and Ollie as well from the newsroom in uh, Channel 3. Everyone loved it. We all need uh, a little happiness every now and then, right? That's right. And also joining us on Zoom right now, Norman Garrick, Professor Emeritus of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Connecticut. Good morning, Norman. Good morning, Frankie. It's a pleasure to be here. And and congratulations on the new show. Thank you so much, Norman. We appreciate it. To my left, actually, it's kind of across to me, in studio. He happens to be the first in-studio guest of the new wheelhouse it's Ken Dixon from CT Insider. Woohoo! <laughs> Ken's really excited because uh, in 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 something I think that's terrific. Uh, he drove here today, obviously, to get here, but he also had an experience with transportation driving up here. Obviously, a great uh, Connecticut experience. Yeah, I'm raging. Yeah, he's he's having a hard time. He's the first guest in uh, the in studio in the new wheelhouse history. You can be the first. Phone guest, you could be the first guest to call us over the phone and join us on the conversation here on the Wheelhouse. If you call 888-720-9677, that's 888-720-WNPR. Let me get serious for a minute. Norman, before we break apart some of these bills that are before lawmakers here in Connecticut, I want to know, why are roadways becoming more dangerous in Connecticut? What's going on? Well, it follows a trend that is happening all over the country. Um, in that we have seen an increase, particularly in pedestrian deaths over the last 10 or so years. Um, the answers are not definitive, but people have um, proposed that things like the much larger size of vehicles, the fact that more people are walking, and there is some evidence that the, the marijuana laws might have had some small impact also. So lots of different things combined. Is it more that the vehicles are bigger and more lethal? Yes, there is a lot of um, discussion about that. Unfortunately, not enough research to to actually pinpoint what exactly is going on. But there are two things going on with vehicles. It seems to me that one of the things is that vehicles are safer for people in the vehicles themselves, but they're less safe for people outside of the vehicles. And that is part of what we're seeing all over the country. Yeah, and when you talk about all over the country, Norman, is it outside of Connecticut, is this similar kind of rise? We saw 230 deaths last year. Is this similar kind of rise happening? Well, the last year number, I would caution on that because that's really um, an anomaly that um, I don't know what... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> How you can explain that massive rise last year. I think it's really, we really need to look at the longer term trend. And I'm looking at a graph here of Connecticut fatality going back 20 years. And it has been more or less steadily around 300 people dying each year. What is alarming about that is not this just this last year increase, but the fact that it's been steady. If we look at countries 
a lot of countries around the world that have been very serious about traffic fatality, their fatality has plunged from, some of them had fatality rates that were comparable to Connecticut in 2003. Now there are a third or a fourth less than Connecticut. Again, folks can join us in the conversation, and if they want to become the first telephone guest on the wheelhouse, if you're out there, we want to hear your voice. Give us a call, 888-720-WNPR, 888-720-9677. Susan, in response to what we're talking about, what are Connecticut lawmakers saying about this? They're considering a number of bills seeking to make roads safer. Let's dive into some of them. What about the proposal to lower the blood alcohol limit? is going to be the more controversial, but I really think the issue, and um, uh, Connecticut has a new uh, head of the Department of Transportation, Garrett Ucolito, who told lawmakers just a couple of weeks ago, Connecticut has a drinking problem, so does the country. And while all this education, everything, what we are seeing, uh, especially during the pandemic, a huge increase in people on the roads who are drinking. Uh, in fact, the chairman of the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, testified at that same hearing uh, and was re- recommending that, you know, the, the states take the 0.05 approach. You know, right now the blood alcohol is 0.08. I think he said something like 11,000 people die on our roads across the country every year because of alcohol. Only Utah uh, gone to 0.05. There was some testimony saying that it it hasn't hurt their tourism. You know, maybe their drinking habits uh, are different in Utah than they are in Connecticut. But I, I, I think that's a bigger challenge, trying to lower the blood alcohol. I mean, we have a hard time getting people 0.08 off our roads, much less uh, for that. Um, I think the pandemic had a lot to do with that. Um, They found that that was the biggest spike. So despite all the efforts to try to educate people on drinking and driving, we are seeing uh, a lot more of it. Um, And they are doing things. Connecticut, uh, I think the budget has $20 million in it. That's mainly for wrong way crashes. That's another area of impaired drivers, more than 70% of people who cause wrong way crashes. I know people like to think it's elderly drivers, uh, but it's not. Uh, These are crashes that happen late at night and they're pretty horrific. Um, So those, that $20 million is being used for um, warning Mm -hmm. lights and signs at different uh, off ramps. And I think the state wants to use some federal money for what are those rumble uh, strips? strips so yeah. that right. So if you go onto an, uh, a ramp the wrong way, uh, you know you will be warned. But I think alcohol is the main problem, and I agree mm-hmm. that marijuana probably plays a factor in that as well. And Ken, it's interesting. Ken Ken Dixon, government and politics reporter for CT Insider. Ken, it's interesting. Utah, you Utah, Utah, Yukon and Utah. Connecticut and Utah in in the same sentence on something here. We could be a second in the nation here to go to point oh five. Well, you know, it's all that powder uh, skiing at Mount Southington that we have. Um, I I think it's uh, definitely a hangover from the pandemic. The roads were wide open; people could speed whatever, however they wanted to. That's still uh, in play, um, and uh, you know, I'm fine with point oh five. It's like. Uh, if, if you're drinking, you shouldn't be on the road at all. And unfortunately, the the police is so understaffed, state police and local police, that I don't I don't know how uh, I, it, they'll be checking people after crashes. But um, as far as drunk st- drunk stops, I'm I don't see it. We're gonna get some we're gonna get some reaction from you both on on this uh, upcoming clip, and maybe Norman as well. Susan, Christine Cohen, a Democratic state senator representing several shoreline municipalities, including East Haven and Guilford, recently spoke in favor of lowering the blood alcohol content threshold at a transportation committee meeting she chaired. Here's that clip. With all of the public transportation options available, with the ride shares and ride services available, uh, like Ubers and Lyfts and taxis and CT Transit and other transit district bus services and, uh, you know, family, friends, we want people to think differently uh, about going out. And something I have to point out, and I feel like I have to point it out here, is that these comments happen six days before a Democratic lawmaker in the state 
Robin Comey, arrested for operating under the influence after uh, crashing a car in Hartford Thursday and being found to have been over this current legal blood alcohol content threshold. Go right. Ahead, I Susan. think that um, Christine uh, Cohen's points are, are, are certainly, uh, you know, resonate. And, and, and But I'm not sure that's an easy thing to accomplish lowering. The, I mean, only one other state has done that. So I think we have to look at, you know, why is this happening? You know, one of the one of the things that was eye opening for me and, you know, this is across the board. This people everywhere are drinking. It doesn't matter, you know, how old you are, what color you are. It's happening everywhere. And I talked to some educated uh, people recently, and someone said to me, they went out and had three martinis. And I said, oh, you know, um, you know, you must not have driven home. And this person said to me, but I did. And I said, so you went out and had three martinis and that was OK. So, well, I wasn't going far. And I wonder if that's part of this, that people, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're going across the street. But maybe people feel it's not a big deal or they're not going far. And so I think that the bigger picture is why is that happening and how do we address that? And I know one of the proposals is to have more um, alcohol awareness, education when people take any kind of driver's ed classes. But quite honestly, we've been doing that, right? I mean, you'd be, have to be living under a rock not to know that you shouldn't drink and drive. Ride share not as cheap as it as it used to be, not as affordable as it used to no, be. No, but and that's we're in a, Connecticut that... as well too. You know, like Connecticut's not like a a, a big uh, city, New York City situation or a Las Vegas where an Uber might be uh, uh, more at your beck and call. I guess lawmakers can't. Uh, but that's psychoanalyze uh, it is, people. Yes. They can only pass laws. Right. Uh, but that's such an option now. I mean, back years ago, people didn't have Uber and Lyft. And there are many, many alternatives and many options, uh, including having a designated driver before. So I, I think it's perplexing to understand or try to figure out why people are just willing uh, to, to risk it. And people are shocked. I mean, Connecticut now is the third in the country with alcohol related fatalities, the third in the country. Should underscore this, though, as Susan is is essentially saying, if you get the opportunity and you feel like you've had a drink or maybe too many, Christine Cohen would say one is too many here, but uh, the, the state senator from Connecticut. But uh, Uber, Lyft, whatever you can, call a taxi cab, call the police if you have to uh, to help you out, if you feel like that's something that you could do. Anyway, Ken, any idea how this arrest of Robin Comey is impacting lawmakers at the Capitol on this issue, transportation safety? Well, I think it's impacting less than um, than Quentin Williams' death in a wrong way mm. crash, you know, earlier in the session. Uh, that first day, it, that, that was, it affected, you know, all 187 lawmakers, staff, the whole building. Um, the Comey thing... I think people are trying to figure out how she was able to flip the car in like a downtown block, you know, the t- uh, two blocks from the Capitol. And, well, and she hit a parked car and then a dumpster. I spoke to the police officer, uh, who, you know, who's handling the case, the lieutenant, um, you know, but it, it raises the question, you know, people who know and leaving the Capitol uh, drinking and it's i just got some numbers here 385 people were killed on connecticut roadways more than 1400 people were seriously injured and so far this year alone 45 people have been killed before we pivot to wrong way driving and we're going to do that with susan ken i just got to ask you support for this in the state house it gets through committee, it seems like, uh, the, the .05 threshold, but I think, and this is the crux of your story for CT Insider, doesn't mean that it's going to go through with full support later on in the uh, General Assembly. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is the name of the game. Um, if they want to get serious about it, I, I don't think it's the one drink. I think it's the second and third drink and body weight. Um, you know, you and I are bigger than a five foot tall um, lawmaker, you know, from from the um, fair, uh, New Haven County. Um, it, it, it's uh, it's the reason why we show up for work every day, Frankie, to watch this stuff happen. What what about the the, the support issue? Right. I mean, it looks like it, I think it went through 21 to 15. But that to you said that it was kind of soft. Yeah, that yeah, that is soft. Um, it's just a wait and see thing. I, I don't like predicting something like that. 
Marijuana, though, that's something that that uh, Republicans seem to be talking about in terms of this bill, right? And that's yeah, maybe they wanna, why they're not supporting it. They want to relitigate it. I, I think they were compartmentalizing. They're they're still in. Uh, I'm, the, the jury is out on the, the, the effect of cannabis on drivers. Anyway, that's one of the the problems with it. Uh, there's a drug recognition. A portion of this uh, Vision Zero bill, one of like 20 some odd bills the Transportation Committee passed. Um, in the Transportation Committee, the Republicans voted against it because they want to relitigate cannabis. Does seem like that as such, but uh, we're, Vision Zero, I'm glad you brought that up. That's something we're going to talk about uh, in the upcoming segment. Before we get there, Susan. You mentioned earlier about how Garrett Ucolito recently said about impaired driving in Connecticut. He said the state has a drunk driving problem. He said lowering the BAC threshold would be the best way to cut down on wrong way driving. So that's why we, we talk about impaired driving. It may have a big impact on wrong way driving as well. Right. And wrong way driving has skyrocketed. And I think over 70 percent of the wrong way crashes involve either someone drinking, drugs or both. Right. And so because of those crashes and they are horrific uh, and they are doing things uh, to uh, you know, mitigate some of it or at least bells and whistles. But. It's a, it's, a, it's a substance abuse problem. I think it's early, too early to know the impact, certainly of marijuana. And let's face it, you know, Massachusetts has, marijuana has been legal there for a couple, two or three years now. So people go there and drive. Uh, but I think it's a misnomer you hear all the time. People say, oh, if I, you know, people smoke pot, they're going to drive slower. They're not a danger. That's simply not true. I mean, your reaction to and your reflexes uh, are different so you know we have a problem in the state we have a problem in the country it was brought out earlier this is not something that's unique to connecticut but connecticut is is by far uh seeing experiencing some of the most deadliest roads in the country dot has also identified about 120 exit entrance ramps that are um, confusing potentially confusing and, right, and I think they have to. They have plans to do more, but they're doing 120 now, right? And then they have plans to do more. 39-year-old man we lose before this session, uh, a good friend of, of Susan's as well to many, uh, Quentin Williams. Q, this is something that has, I would imagine, spurred lawmakers to do something about this. Do you, do you feel that urgency, Susan? Are you feeling that when you're going to the Capitol? Absolutely. And it's uh, on both sides. You know, Quentin Williams' death uh, impacted lawmakers, you know, Republicans and Democrats. And I think there is a lot of uh, passion. One of the things so that I can't understand, I mean, it's been almost three months and the uh, toxicology um, uh, report the auto has not come out yet. And so I think people want to know exactly what happened in that wrong way crash. Uh, but I, I do think that people at the Capitol... Near an on-ramp in Cromwell. Correct. Right. And how and it was uh, he hit head on. I mean, his car caught fire uh, quite right after he was hit. Last question before we go to a break here. I'm going to direct it to Norman. You surprised that lawmakers are taking up uh, the point oh five, maybe some some aspects of the wrong way driving. What's your analysis, Norman? I'm not surprised by um, lawmakers reacting to very um, public events that that gets a lot of attention and i think that's what you're seeing here so yeah that that's the typical reaction is it's actually i think it's good but at the same time it's really very kind of reactive coming up we dive deeper into how lawmakers are proposing to mitigate wrong way driving and what might actually work stick with us more on transportation in connecticut coming up if you want to join us on the conversation the new wheelhouse Call us, 888-720-9677, 888-720-9677. 
If you're just tuning in, you're listening to The New Wheelhouse from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Frankie Graziano, and we've been talking about lawmakers' efforts to make the roads safer in Connecticut. I've got with me on Zoom Susan Raff from News Channel 3. I also have Norm Garrick from the University of Connecticut, and in studio with me across from me, I have Ken Dixon from CT Insider. Several bills being debated in the State House this session. We just got an update from the state DOT during the show. Actually been 385 total highway fatalities in CT, and that was some great help from Susan Raff as well to report that. But before we continue this conversation, let's invite the first guest in the history of the new wheelhouse via telephone here. This is going to be Celeste from Granby. Go ahead, Celeste. What do you got to say? Good morning, everybody. Congratulations on your new show. Thank you, Celeste. Very exciting. My re- the reason for my call is that I have to go back and forth frequently to south uh, western Connecticut, and I find that the new passing lane is now the right lane. I wasn't aware that the driving uh, laws had changed, and I notice also that the police don't seem to enforce the fact that people just choose to sort of make the regular driving lane the left lane and lo and behold, where do we have most of our accidents? They're in, it's in the left lane. I, I'm i sort of baffled because we also know that uh, driver's ed has disappeared. And one of the first things we all learned when we got to be as old as I am is that you pass on the left and you drive on the right. So that's my concern. The police don't seem to enforce it. And we have an awful lot of people that just assume that it's easier to drive in the left lane. Celeste, thank you for being the first caller on the history of the new wheelhouse. We appreciate your call very much. I had I, I'm in the studio with Ken, so I saw a smirk. As uh, you got anything to add there? Can you can you help out? Uh, oh, Celeste, I got passed maybe? by a bunch of people on the way up here on the right hand <laughs> side, and it's like, and more people are not using their turn signals either. I'm figuring, you know, that the cars aren't being equipped with them anymore. He's saying, is this Massachusetts or is it Connecticut? I'm sorry, our neighbors to the north. I'm having some fun with you. Norman, any kind of analysis based on what we just heard from Celeste's uh, telephone call? Well, I think the only thing I can, uh, only response I can have there is my own observation. And I don't think I've noticed any difference <laughs> in terms of how people are behaving in regards to that. I use 384 often to get into Hartford. And I often see people passing on the left. And I have not noticed any change in in, re, in enforcement either on that particular road. We have one more clip that I'd like to play for, for you folks, and it involves a new initiative that they have in Connecticut. If we can get that clip, please. Look for the signs. Be sure you're going the right way, because one wrong move may be your last. Norm, what do you make of this uh, new public awareness campaign that we have here in Connecticut that's coming up? Well, one of the things I um, wanted to t- say in this uh, discussion is that a lot of the effort by the um, the state um, legislators are really directed at the users of the road. Mm. There is a discussion about zero vision. Zero vision means that you're considering all aspects of um, uh, what contributes to traffic um, safety. Part of that is user behavior. That's fine. But another part of it is about the um, road design. It's it's about the responsibility of the governing bodies to make sure that the roads are safe. So all of these things are part of the effort. And all I hear in Connecticut is about blaming the user mm. for what's happening on the road. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's a lot of individual choices. Which individual choices are going to be important because the, the DOT and the governor aren't with us on a Friday night if we're having a drink. But the big but this is a big this is a big issue that, that Norm brings up. It's there are more some structural uh, things that are larger that are at play. What are some of these structural issues? What are ways I, the state can step in and, 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 and help you out with your choices? I can give you one example. I, I live in stores. I live a mile and a half from work. To get to work, I used to walk to, to work when I had to go to Yukon every day. To get to work, I had to cross 195. 195 is built as a 60-mile-per-hour road. Mm-hmm. It's really 
hair raising to cross that road. It's also dangerous. And over time, years after year after year after year, people have pointed out the problem there. And it's really hard to get anything changed because the state has the attitude that this is a state road, that it needs to be higher speed, that it needs to be mostly about getting cars moving rather than helping people who want to get around by walking or by bike. So that's one structural problem that we're seeing in Connecticut. Susan, any response to some of these structural issues we're talking about here? Even the caller had one as well. I think overall, I mean, transportation affects us all, right? Whether we're driving, whether we're walking, whether we're riding a bike. And I think that, you know, they're trying to, the state is trying to address it from so many different angles. And whether it's a new ad campaign, uh, public testimony, um, you know, we have to feel safe on our roads. We have to go to work. I mean, some of us are fortunate if we can take a bus or we can walk, but a lot of us, especially in Connecticut, have to drive on our roads. And I think that in addition to some of the legislative uh, initiatives, we have to have conversations with people in our communities. And we have to talk to people and our friends and our family about the choices that they make. I think that's where it ultimately starts. Legislative efforts to bring in open containers. I want to talk about that. But before we talk about these Vision Zero kind of bills, I've got another phone caller on the line. This is a friend from New London. Braden, go ahead. Braden's not there. We can take another phone call instead. How about our friend in Hartford, Beth? Go ahead, Beth. Hi. Hi. Um, So I live in the west end of Hartford, and I can try to bike or walk most places I need to go. But in most of Connecticut, to get a cross light, you need to press a button and wait a long time, which stops traffic in both directions. And I know there was a DOT study about in pedestrians walk, giving an automatic cross sign one way. And... I'd like to hear about where that is and any thoughts about that. Beth, congratulations on being the second caller in the history of the new wheelhouse. Norman, do you have any answers for Beth? I don't know the specifics of that. I remember the the study. Um, In a lot of places in Connecticut, that is true, that we have something called a scramble where everything stops and then you can cross diagonally or um, across the specific road. I don't know if there's been any move to change that, but it seems to be the still still the prevailing situation at most lights that I've um, encountered. And while we're on bikers and, and kind of pedestrian safety, I want to check in with one more caller here because I just want to make sure that we pinpoint this issue before we move on. Kelly in Hartford, you call us. Pedestrian safety, what do you have? Yeah, um, so I live in downtown Hartford uh, myself, and about a month and a half ago, uh, my boyfriend and I, we adopted a dog, so naturally, we're both out more, just like walking around, you have to walk a dog, and I was appalled by the lack of awareness by drivers, and downtown Hartford's not even, like, pedestrian-wise, especially at night, it's not even an extremely populous area of the city, which makes me concerned for residents in other areas of the city. Um, you see you see drivers blowing through red lights, like speeding through red lights, just because they don't see any traffic. And it's, it's just extremely concerning. And it's like, you know, you think to yourself, how do you even begin to fix that problem? Because it, it seems to me like just a lack of caring about just people on the street, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's just kind of heartbreaking, but that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much for your call. We appreciate it. Only got a couple of minutes left in the segment here. Also, legislative efforts here uh, to address open containers in Connecticut, Ken. Um, well, first of all, there are three sections in the Vision Zero bill, um, a couple pertaining to taking land for bike lanes, um, a study of pedestrian uh, issues, and red light cameras. Uh, the last caller might be interested in uh, for a increased traffic enforcement. Um, oh, oh, you want to talk about open containers? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's one of those bills that comes up every year and it dies every year for different reasons. Um, 
uh, it's a, it's a holdover. I think there are only four states left that allow open containers. Uh, so if we're driving uh, to happy hour, you know, we can you can have a beer while I'm driving, Frankie. And you can say, and, and this was something that stopped it, was that you could almost pretend like it's not your beer because yeah. of that. So that's what killed this. Or maybe you're having the beer close to your house. You're trying to get away from your family, something like that. And they realized that uh, that can uh, also criminalize, that could be incriminating. That was one of the uh, ways it died over the years. Uh, the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus um, were talking about... Um, urban life and you've got a friend over and the wife and the kids uh, the place is getting a little crowded so you just sit in the car in front of the house and that's was being used as probable cause in racial profiling. I got to try to do this in like 30 seconds to a minute but Susan this is something you've covered in the past this came up in Norwich. It is it came up it's got to be almost 20 years ago and it was one of the saddest uh, terrible things I've ever covered it was a young uh, a daughter and a, her bro- a girl and her brother, the Deglins, Samantha was the girl's name, and they were very young and they were coming back from the Norwich Free Academy for, I think, a theater production uh, rehearsal. And they were uh, hit and killed by someone uh, driving. And it turned out that he was not drunk, but he admitted that he had taken his eyes off the wheel uh, to have a sip of beer. And I think it's one of those things in Connecticut that people don't realize that it's not illegal, right? I mean, most people would think, and in fact, when we cover crashes and uh, people comment there that in the investigation says, well, there were open containers of alcohol in the car. Um, so because of the fact that he was not drunk, it didn't matter. And I remember how egregious that was. And one of the most horrific things was that the father of those two children was the ER doctor at Bacchus Hospital was actually treating his own children. Uh, but they uh, were very um, uh, vocal in trying to push for legislation uh, to close that loophole, if you will, or to make it that it would be illegal to have open containers. And here we are 20 years later, and it's still not illegal. Susan, thank you for your perspective and always for your coverage. We got another phone call we want to take. We're going to talk to Brett from Newington. Brett, go ahead. You're the fourth caller now in wheel, new wheelhouse history. Go ahead, Brett. Woohoo! <laughs> I think this. <laughs> I think the smarter the cars get, in, in quote smarter, um, the stupider the drivers get. You know, they have bright dashes for the daylight, but at night they don't realize their headlights and tail lights are not on. It took me three minutes to, you know, inform someone you know, shining my high beams behind them in a parking lot, just trying to get to them before they get out in real traffic. And, uh, but I see this all the time. Yeah, I want to, yeah, go ahead. And there's so many more other distractions too, with the, you know, Bluetooth automatically hooking up. So then they're trying to get their music on, blah, blah, blah. The smarter they are, the stupider the drivers on average. I got to cut. I'm glad he. that's a, such a great way for him to end and, and, and a great way for us to end this conversation as well. It's been great to have Ken Dixon in studio from CT Insider. Thank you for joining us today, Ken. Oh, sure, man. Norman Garrick from the University of Connecticut. Norman, thank you so much for your perspective and helping us zoom out on this issue. Thank you. Very important discussion. And Susan Raff, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it, Susan. Channel 3. Thank you, and congratulations again, and uh, Wheelhouse is a great show, and uh, I think this was a good conversation for all of us. So happy to have you on the first new one here. Thank you so much. Coming up, maternity care deserts and what you need to know as folks try to make sure that there are easier opportunities for people giving birth to be able to do this in a desert. This is the new wheelhouse from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Frankie Graziano, and I want to turn to something that's not getting as much attention in the state in terms of the legislature. We're talking a lot about wine and grocery stores. We're talking a lot about uh, transportation safety, which is important. But what we're not talking a lot about is this decrease in access to maternity care, so-called maternity care deserts. They're increasing across the country, including in Connecticut, there are several hospitals that have actually closed their maternity wards in recent years. Rockville's one, Milford's another, New Milford hospitals. 
Several more hospitals are currently proposing to close their labor and delivery units. You may have heard about Sharon Hospital. That's one of them. In response, Governor Ned Lamont's pushing legislators to license freestanding birthing centers as an alternative to traditional hospitals for low-risk pregnancies and deliveries. The bill would also create a pathway to certify doulas. For more on this, we're joined by Alicia McGregor, Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Politics at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning, Frankie. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on today. And folks, if you want to join the conversation and talk about ways to really take care of these maternity care deserts that we have in Connecticut, you could join the conversation, 888-720-9677. Alicia, I know you're not based in Connecticut, but what do you think about our, our governor's proposed solution to maternity care access here? Right. So I was actually very encouraged and actually happy to see the governor's proposal on this issue. I think what it tells us is that the governor recognizes the gravity of the issue of maternity ward closures in Connecticut and across the country, and really what it means when OB units close and leave communities and people no longer have anywhere to go give birth or obtain vital prenatal care services. So looking at the numbers over the last uh, two decades, we know in the first part of the 2000s, 10% of all maternity wards across the nation closed their doors, and that trend continued on through 2020. And um, when it comes to filling these gaps, it's clear that Governor Lamont is thinking in in pretty bold and innovative ways about it. Um, So as you said, by introducing a pathway for freestanding birth centers and by bringing providers like midwives and doulas uh, to the center, what he's what he's actually doing might be bringing us more in line with other countries that have much better outcomes than we do. So thinking of places like France, the UK and Australia, their systems have maternal care workforces that are largely made up of midwives and they have much better outcomes than us. So this might actually bode well for maternal health outcomes in general. The intent here, as I understand it, is to serve low risk pregnancies. I'm not naive enough to think that some new birthing center uh, may be well equipped, especially with whatever the funding we're talking about here is, to take care of high-risk pregnancies. But the the reality is that a lot of these places where there are maternity uh, care deserts, there are a lot of high-risk pregnancies, and there are people that are suffering through higher maternal and infant mortality rates, as I understand it. So is that something we have to consider when we talk about legislation? Maybe not just serving the low-risk pregnancies? Is that something they can do? What do you you think about that, Alicia? Absolutely. So, of course, birth centers would be targeting low-risk pregnancies, which are actually the majority of all pregnancies. But you're right to point out that maternity wards are more likely to close in low-income communities, in communities of color, perhaps places where we see a greater risk for severe maternal health complications. So so that's right. Um, But when it comes to sort of more complicated cases, of course, hospitals would be would be a backstop to these to these birth centers. Why are we seeing maternity care deserts pop up in Connecticut nationwide? What's driving it? Absolutely. So what's driving maternity ward closures has a lot to do with with costs. And that in turn has a lot to do with with our payment system and the ways that we pay hospitals in the United States. So maternity wards like ICUs have very high costs to operate, very high costs for for personnel, around the clock staffing that's necessary, as well as the the kind of equipment that's needed to run a hospital maternity ward. In turn though, they don't attract the the kinds of reimbursements that say a hospital cardiac unit attracts. And um, this has a lot to do with the fact that hospitals receive different payments depending on a person's insurer. And Medicaid, for instance, reimburses at a rate that's a lot lower than commercial insurers. And we know that when it comes to childbirth throughout the country, that more than 40% of all childbirths are paid for for by Medicaid. And so for this reason, OB units tend to be more vulnerable to closures and hospitals see 
OB units as as costly and so called mm. so called money losers. And and actually, Frankie, to your point, um, this is also one of the reasons why OB units are more likely to close in low income communities, com- communities that are more vulnerable to uh, certain health risks that are associated with with uh, severe maternal morbidity and and adverse maternal health outcomes. And this is one of the reasons why those communities are more likely to lose vital maternal health care. So finances seem to be drying this more than anything. Is there something more, anything else we can look at as well? Oh, yeah. So so in the literature on, on hospital closures in general, we know that even after we account for, for finances, there tends to be a disparity in where hospitals are more likely to close their doors and, and a disparity around around race, frankly. So um, even when we account for, for hospital operating margins, we know that hospitals are more likely, particularly urban hospitals over the years, are more likely to close in Black communities. And when it comes to OB units, the, the literature on rural obstetric unit closures finds that that's the case in, in uh, rural counties as well. So counties with a higher percentage of Black residents were much more likely to see um, OB units shut their doors. And when we take a look at work that we've done in New Jersey, which is largely an, an urban hospital landscape, urban and suburban, we found that in from 2000 to 2015, the majority of OB units that closed in the state had majority non-white um, non-white patient pools, so race and, and racism definitely plays a role here. Let's dive deeper into the disparities. Let's put some numbers to this in some context. From Ken Dixon, who just joined us into the studio, this is Connecticut specific. He's from CT Insider. He's citing data from the state of Connecticut. Says people of color account for forty five percent of the childbirths in Connecticut. They also account for 60% of maternal and infant deaths. There's a disparity. And nationally, NPR recently reported on a CDC study exposing 1,200 deaths of women up to 42 days after delivery in 2021. I think that's the the measure. It's up to 42 days after delivery. In 2021, it was a 32.9 per 100,000 births rate. Also in that CDC report, mortality rate for black women significantly higher than rates for white and Hispanic women as well. So some numbers there to put to the disparities, Alicia. Oh yeah, absolutely. When when we take a look at these disparities, they're they're devastating um, in Connecticut and, and all across the country. So without a doubt, the U.S. is in a maternal health crisis when we look at our outcomes um, compared to All other rich countries, we have the highest maternal mortality rate, um, and that rate has only been increasing over the last 30 years, getting worse and worse throughout the pandemic. And um, those increases in maternal mortality are really largely being being borne by Black and and Latino Latinx women. So um, the fact that maternity wards are also more likely to leave these communities really just really just compounds the situation. And just to underscore that, Alicia, why is it what does it mean when when these when these maternity words leave the communities they're in? What are the consequences? Let's let's dive further into that. We know death, obviously, in in some of these statistics, some some maybe some higher risk pregnancies. What do you got? Oh, most definitely. So one of the one of the first things that happens is that obviously it prolongs the time it takes to get to the hospital. So when when you're in labor, when you're attending a, a prenatal appointment, say you need to go to the hospital for you need to get certain scans, your the travel time increases, that this increases the sort of the mental health burden associated with with delivery, with um with obtaining treatment. And um, for for folks who don't have reliable access to transportation, who might rely on, say, an ambulance on the day of delivery, this you know this can pose problems if, say, the hospital that they that they go to instead might not have beds at the time. And and you know we see that happening in other in places where we're we're currently doing research. And in in these cases, 
these patients can be can be diverted, which which ends up really adding more risks to their um, to their delivery experience and potentially worsening outcomes outcomes as well. But yep. what we also know from from our research in uh, in New Jersey as well is that for folks who delivered after their nearest OB unit closed, their rates of severe maternal morbidity were higher than those who uh, delivered in a time when their nearest OB unit was still open. So, so we we see differences here that are that have implications that are are very dangerous for for pregnant people and birthing people. The closures are happening at a time when we're seeing more restrictions on abortion access in the United States. What do you make of these two things happening in tandem? Is it a coincidence? Oh, definitely. So these things happening together, I think, really just adds fuel to the fire to the maternal health crisis. So we know from recent literature and a recent study by the Commonwealth Fund, actually, that those states with more restrictive <clears throat> abortion laws also are more likely to have maternity care deserts and fewer maternity care providers. And so with with that in mind, be, we, we know that for folks who live in a state that might have a law in place that that might prevent them from obtaining an abortion and say they're forced to carry a pregnancy to term in a place without the appropriate infrastructure to care for them. We know we know that that's a dangerous situation for for many reasons. So take, for example, a woman who might have had severe complications in a previous pregnancy, say severe preeclampsia or other very dangerous pregnancy complications. This person, if given the choice, might not choose to to become pregnant again or to carry a pregnancy to term. And for for someone with a condition like that to not have prenatal care close by and to not have OB care close by. I have to jump in here, Alicia, because we only have time for one more question. So I want to try to get some some kind of resolution or maybe something we can prod lawmakers with here to try to actually really think about reproductive health here a, a little better than they have. What are some solutions? Oh, yeah. So the first solution is to put laws in place that stop maternity wards from closing as, as frequently as they are and as disproportionately in vulnerable communities as they are. So as I mentioned, the fact that OB units see a large share of Medicaid patients tends to put more uh, financial distress on these units. For this reason, we we need a, a payment system that increases payment levels for Medicaid. Medicaid should not be paying at rates that are much lower than other payers, which then gives incentives for hospitals to, to avoid communities with large proportions of, of Medicaid insured patients. That that should not be the case. Uh, that That is definitely sort of putting in motion this process and the federal government ought to do, ought to encourage states mm-hmm. to to bring those levels up. There are very different payment rates across the state, across various states. Uh, Another they- thing that I, unfortunately, we got to cut it there. I'm so sorry, Alicia. This is such a great conversation. And obviously, with us cutting time here, shows how important it is to maybe put some more on uh, the maternity care des- desert issue. Thank you so much, Alicia McGregor, for joining us. Thank you, Frankie. I'm Frankie Graziano. Today's show produced by Meg Dalton, technical producer Kat Pastor. Super special shout out to my colleagues Tess Terrible and Katie Talarski for helping us in studio the past few weeks. We couldn't have done this launch without you. And thanks to the people that offered support for the show. Following the announcement, our friends sharing all of the pictures. Thank you so much. Download The Wheelhouse anytime on your favorite podcast app. Thank you for listening.